Underwhelmed is a word. I know it is because I looked it up. Merriam-Webster defines underwhelmed as to fail to impress or stimulate. I was not underwhelmed by Sloan's Underwhelmed when I first heard it on 102.1 back in 1992. I was the opposite. I was whelmed, if that's a word. I know it's not because I looked it up. That's one of those skills I learned in my school. There's a podcast from The Ringer called 60 Songs That Explain the 90s. FOTM Hall of Famer Cam Gordon, Director of Communications at Twitter Canada before Elon Musk realized he had no need for such luxuries, once told me the Ringer founder, Bill Simmons, is who you'd get if Leo Rowdens and I had a baby. Physically, at least. 60 Songs That Explain the 90s is hosted by Rob Harvilla, and he's unabashedly American. I don't hold that against him. He's American. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it means there's very little CanCon on his list. His list of 60 that became 90 and will likely grow again as of this moment includes exactly and precisely three CanCon jams. There's You Oughta Know by Ottawa's Alanis Morissette, Man, I Feel Like a Woman by Shania Twain from Timmins, Ontario, and My Heart Will Go On by Charlemagne Quebec's own Celine Dion. Alanis, Shania, and Celine three Canadian queens who require no surname. And here's a mind blow for you. I hope you're sitting down. The top three albums by women in terms of global sales are, in this order, Shania Twain's Come On Over from 1997, Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill from 1995, and Celine Dion's Falling Into You from 1996. Come On Over sold 40 million units. Jagged Little Pill sold 33 million units. And Falling Into You sold 32 million units. This list is not just Canadian women. It's all women around the world. You ought to know. But we share... Shania, Alanis, and Celine. Hey, share. Shania, Alanis, Celine. All women who need no surnames, but I digress. We share Shania, Alanis, and Celine with the world. And that's cool. But what about the 90s jams we kept for ourselves? Who's celebrating the 90s songs we didn't share? Okay, I'll do it. Because someone has to. I'm Toronto Mike, blogger, podcaster, podcast producer, and proud cyclist and father of four, in that order. And this is 90s CanCon that blew Toronto Mike's mind. Sorry, that was a working title. Let's just call this episode 1310 of Toronto mike colon, underwhelmed. Halifax's Sloan was, and is, Chris Murphy, Jay Ferguson, Patrick Pentland, and Andrew Scott. They formed in January 1991 and took their name from the pronunciation of their friend Jason Larson's nickname when said by Larson's boss. That nickname was Slow One, but it sounded like Sloan because the boss had a French accent. The big trade was that Chris, Jay, Patrick, and Andrew could name their band after Larson, but Larson would get to be on the cover of their Peppermint EP. Done and done. But why did I tell you all of that? I just realized I had Chris Murphy, composer and singer of Underwhelmed, over to my home, and we recorded an episode of Toronto Mike'd. Together, 
And of course I asked him about Underwhelmed, but I also asked him about the band name. Here's what Chris Murphy told me. First question, tough one. I'm sure you get asked it all the time, but what's the uh, origin of the name Sloan? What's this, the origin story? Um, it's just uh, our friend had the nickname Sloan. Uh, he played in the band called the Straight Jackets. They were just kind of one of our contemporaries. And um, and he was called Sloan because his he worked in a factory, or at one time he worked in a factory, and his boss, who was, I think, French, although I don't know if that plays into it, but would refer to him as the slow one. And he, he was called Sloan. And then our the story goes, and I think it's true, that we said we wanted to call our band Sloan. And he said, you can call your band Sloan as long as you put a picture of my face on the on your record so his p- picture does appear on the cover of our first ep which predates our first full-length record so it came out in the summer of 1992 and it was called peppermint and on the front was this guy his name is jason Lar- larson and he was Sloan. so it has nothing to do with ferris bueller's day off no and uh that's a movie that i saw at the time and i was that that came out at a time when i was uh you know becoming aware of um counterculture and punk and stuff like that and so a lot of people loved ferris bueller and still do and i remember i was at the age where it came at the exact time when i was like really is it cool to lip sync twist and shout i don't know if that's that cool You're like that's bullshit so i was like too oh you can swear on this oh yeah yeah you can swear well anyway so yeah i thought that was like bull crap and um, uh, um yeah so i I, I, yeah, so it doesn't have anything to do with Ferris. I'd have nothing against Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but like I kind of sometimes I have this sort of my persona doesn't like certain things like Americana music or whatever, and but it's not really the way I feel. I just sort of exaggerate. So like I kind of come come out like I was like I was too cool for Ferris Bueller's Day Off when it came out. Twi- people think Twist and Shout is a Beatles song. It's actually the Isley Brothers. That's right. And but people, the funny thing about that is, yeah. Well, their first song was their first song was called Shout. You make me wanna shout na, na, na. from Animal House. Yeah, well, I know. Yeah, from but, you, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, well, be, but Animal House. The dramatic time of that is of the time of shout or whatever. But um, and then of course the the twist was so big that they had basically it just reeks of someone saying, "Okay, boys, go back and uh, add <laughs> add twist to that thing." And get, that's right. But uh, twist and shout is great, and uh, and of course I know it mostly as the Beatles, and I think I believe the the version that he lip syncs in the movie is the Beatles. Definitely. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. You gotta love a Ferris Bueller tangent. That Peppermint EP included a version of the Chris Murphy penned Underwhelmed, but not the version you know. It's similar, no doubt, but not quite there. The song was re-recorded for Sloan's debut full-length album, Smeared. And that's the version you likely know best. Much like how The Pursuit of Happiness re-recorded I'm an Adult Now for Love Junk, only without the Rundgren. When Rob Harvilla plays a song, there's a sound effect of someone pressing play on a tape deck. Now, I could see that for 80s songs, but by the 1990s, I had fully switched to CDs. I didn't buy Peppermint but I did buy Smeared, and of course, I bought it on CD. But let's hear a little bit of the Peppermint EP version of Underwhelmed. She was underwhelmed, if that's a word. I know it's not, because I looked it up. That's one of the skills that I learned in my school.
I bought Smeared on CD, and I bought it because of one song I heard on CFNY. I bought Smeared because of Underwhelmed, and I have zero regrets. Sure, you could catch Underwhelmed on much music, but I don't remember it as part of their regular rotation. At least I don't remember seeing it alongside Nirvana and Pearl Jam. You had to catch it on Much East or The Wedge. Note to self, get Simon Evans on Toronto Miked. The video for Underwhelmed by Sloan was in black and white, mostly. And it had a low-budget, uber-cool, early 90s vibe. It's mostly just the band playing live. But it got them on much music and in TV rooms and rec rooms and living rooms across the country. But for me, it was a CFNY jam. Speaking of low budget, guess the entire cost of recording Smeared at Halifax's Sound Market Studio. Go ahead, take a wild stab at it. Take a guess. I'll wait. Okay, that's way high. $1,200 $1,200 Canadian. Smeared was recorded at a low cost of 1200 Canadian dollars. Big like Leanne Rhymes because I'm all about value. That's 1200 bucks to record Smeared. Did I mention Chris Murphy's been over to my home and we recorded an episode of Toronto Miked together? Did I mention I asked him about Underwhelmed? Here's Chris Murphy telling me about Underwhelmed. She was underwhelmed if that's a word. I know it's not because I looked it up. That's one of the skills that I learned in my school. I was overwhelmed and I'm sure. Yeah, I can listen to this whole thing now. I got to say a couple of things for me right now, which is uh, I'm a teenager when this comes out. So I'm listening to a lot of uh, CFNY. I think it was The Edge back then. Yep. And it was uh, the big stuff I was really into after the public enemy and the hair, after the hair bands all disappear and we get, it's Nirvana and Pearl Jam and then uh, Bad Motor Finger from Soundgarden, like this grunge, I guess we'd call it. Sure. Okay? So grunge hits and we're talking Seattle and stuff. And then CFNY starts playing this track. I loved it. The first time I heard it, I loved it. I still love this track 25 years later. This is one of yours. Yep. I'm only. I'm going to try to focus on your stuff. Yeah, That's, I wish you would. I am. I'm gonna focus on <laughs> I don't stuff. care. Like, I, can, I can talk. I can speak to any of that stuff. But I'm going to... Don't worry. I, 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 I've got my homework done. Well, quick, quick sidebar. Yeah. With this Trans Canada Highwayman thing, am I am I getting ahead of myself? Should well, I? Well, I mean, I'm going. I'm going to do a whole. You can, I I mentioned. Yeah, well, let's, let's, I'm going to do a post Sloan. I have a lot of Trans. You Canada you can Highwaymen. you can you can run it, but but in Trans Canada Highwayman, I'm supposed to bring, you know, four songs that I can do kind of thing. So I you are so a little ahead of yourself because I I've got all this is that's never mind. Up, it's never mind. Strike is it by, from the record. That is the Nirvana album I was listening to in 1992. Understood. The okay. So here's my question. A few questions. The first big question is. And this, I only learned this as an adult, and I feel almost like misled by you, and I'm angry at you because you tell us right off the top that underwhelmed is not a word, okay? But it's it in is. the dictionary. Yeah. Okay, speak to that. It's pre Google. Like, I don't know. Like, uh, I just thought it was funny. But you didn't have access to a library with the uh, Oxford Dictionary. Well, I'm the scope of, of, of the journal or whatever self conscious, like, book this got written in when i was a teenager uh i didn't think oh my god i wonder if maybe it is a word maybe i'm lying in this song and then what then what will happen because that this this song came along at a time when i was literally writing in a journal like a little goofball like in the coffee shop writing you know poetry and um but and this and it predates so this gets recorded in in 19 September 1991 so we recorded this there are two versions of yes. this song so the original version was recorded in September 1991 it was the first thing that we ever recorded and um 
and that was right as Nirvana was was happening. So we we owe a lot to the timing of, uh, of Nirvana changed our lives and and uh, and and gave us an opportunity. Basically, the one big opportunity we had in our life that we're still we haven't had an opportunity since. I mean, that's not true, but like that was. We're we're still like blowing. Well, I say blowing on the ember of the opportunity we were given because of Nirvana. So this, <laughs> but 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 this song I think is from even like four or five years before that. It was just like in a book. Like I just had the poem, you know, as it were. Right. And do you and still have that book, by the way? Uh, I probably do. Because Kurt Cobain so. had a book like that. I know Kurt Cobain, you know, blows his brains out at twenty-seven. It's a whole different story. But I bought. I literally bought the copy of his notebook. Right, like that he was doing the same thing you're describing, and but yeah, mine was decidedly less nihilistic, but right. you know, but it was just as you know, it would be just as embarrassing to to read <laughs> now because I was just saying stuff like, why you know why do those jerks get those have those girls or whatever like pathetic <laughs> like sensitive boy. <laughs> okay, now okay, so you mentioned you owe a lot to Nirvana, so. Two things come to my mind, which is one, now you got a bunch of, like, The Edge is a good example in Toronto. That station now... We didn't have anything like that in Halifax. I didn't even know that existed. Because that station, now that it's going... Of course, there's there's a CanCon rule here, too, which we'll get to, but uh, now that that's the music they're going with, whatever they were calling it, new rock or modern rock or whatever, we can call it grunge, whatever, uh, you fit in... That sound that we just played with Underwhelmed fits so perfectly with that... I heard like that was a high rotation uh, on our local modern rock station. That's right, but but the um, it kind of uh, CFMY slash like one hundred two point one the Edge or whatever that that they were a that was a vanguard station. So there weren't very many alternative rock stations at that time. So I really that was the only place that we that that song got any play is that right I so guess, like outside of the right place outside of the gta yeah uh, the, outside of toronto um you know that wouldn't even be on the radar of a lot of people you know we would say here the, here we're gonna play underwhelmed and if it with if, if within 200 miles of toronto people would be like all right but outside they're like play the future what? shop song or whatever <laughs> The, that's funny. Okay, so we, we we started talking about Halifax as like Canada, Seattle. This was the scene. Yeah, we we took advantage of that too. We were self conscious of that and thought it was goofy, but and uh, but we we benefited from that for sure. And who else? I'm thinking Thrush Hermit, right? With uh, Joel Plaskett. This was the yeah. like and, and Sarah McLaughlin was there at the time. Is that right? She was there in high school. And she left right after high school. She went to Vancouver or something like that. Yeah, that's right. So she's associated with Vancouver. Um, that's she didn't. Yeah. So you wouldn't know. People didn't know who she was until Vancouver. But I did. I remember her from being kind of on the scene. Although I didn't really run with her. Like I, I could count the amount of times that I was in the same room with her, like on one hand. But uh, I, I wasn't, I was, uh, I was really, um, I come from the, the sort of like the hardcore punk scene was what I was into. So she was playing music around town, but I would have thought it was just lightweight and, you know, I would probably maybe like it now. But at the time I, I was too uh, rough for that. What about uh, Joel Plaskett? Like what's your relationship like with him? I think at one point I was kind of a mentor character for him. You know, I don't want to put any kind of importance on my role in what he's done. Like he has really um, kicked ass, like, uh, and really has a little empire down there. And I think he's good to people and all that stuff. But I have a romantic um, uh, memory of hanging out with him. He was literally a sixteen-year-old boy, and I would have been twenty-three or whatever. So I'm seven years his senior and now we're the same age but at one point you know what i mean like uh sure. yeah at one point i was uh an older kid and and i was kind of hot shit in in uh town and sloan i got a record deal with geffen even before our record deal like we were kind of like the happening band in town and we liked them and uh and we kind of gave them some opportunities but and i remember at one point they were it got to the point where uh not just with them but the other groups too our involvement, you know, so originally no one had uh, aspirations of having a record deal or, or getting out of town or anything. So then all of a sudden Nirvana happens. The world is upside down. The music industry is looking, comes looking for people like us and they find us and we got a, a great, a big break. And 
so then the then the the aspirations of everybody else in in Halifax and probably you know all over the world or whatever changed. It was like, hey, I'm in a cool punk, basically punk band that can write songs too, and so you know we put out a, the first little EP by Thrush Hermit and we we supported them and took them on tour and all that stuff. But but came a time where where our involvement with these groups um, almost seemed like a detriment because they they were all seen as like Sloan's little brothers and like just like right, we right. we kind of owned the story of being from Halifax and so it would have been Nirvana as Nirvana was to to Seattle we you know we got to sort of own that story and and all of the groups the super friends um Thrush Hermit Hardship Post I don't know if, if they are yeah. on your radar Jail um yeah Jail is like J A L E that's right right I do and that was women right and they uh a lot of these groups you know had to sort of be these sort of like sub stories of our story. And, uh, and I felt at one point that it was almost like they were like, you know, I don't want to come on tour with you guys anymore. And we were like, come on, like our friends, we're all buds. Right. And they were like, you know, it's kind of not cool anymore. Escaping the shadow. Yeah. There, if you want. Now you mentioned the word sub there. So, so t- tell me how this went. Like, did you sign with sub pop? We did not, but, um, why do I think you signed with sub pop? We did a single on sub pop and, um, and we were buds with, the sub pop people. So we, the, the first people that we spoke to were network. Uh, speaking of Sarah McLaughlin, that was her uh, label. And we talked to people at, at network and they were like, uh, they saw, we, we did a little cross Canada tour, which brought us in May, 1992 to um, Vancouver. And uh, the people at network saw us, but a guy from Geffen came up, and saw us. It wasn't David Geffen. I never met David Geffen. Okay. But we got signed to Geffen by this guy who was like an underling mailroom guy who worked under the stream at Geffen of a guy named Tom Zutat who signed Guns N' Roses. He signed Motley Crue to A&M. He was like, he was like a, a, a big A&R guy. And our guy was like a, a minion of his right, na- named right. Todd Sullivan. And he signed us. And we didn't do much for Geffen, for sure. But then his next signing after us was Weezer, and they <laughs> and they became so big. You could have been the Weezer, man. We could have been Weezer. Had had Weezer's first record been our second record, I would I would I would be a giant. Uh, yeah, you know what he's funny with Weezer because uh, the here so the sec the you guys your first album sme- oh the one your first album main album is smeared smeared yeah and it's got a grungy kind of a uh, sound to it and then. Uh, you put out twice removed, and it's a different sound. And I think there's this perception like, oh, this is different. And then it's although we're gonna get to how it's underappreciated, and then like not, and then time goes by and it's actually super appreciated. But I always think of uh, Weezer because they put out the I don't know the the undone out al- the blue album or something. I think it's, it's just called Weezer or the yeah, blue album. Right. And then the second record was yes, was a real Pinkerton. departure for and, them. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. And then everyone's looking for that again because it's got the undone the sweater song, which is like you're underwhelmed or whatever. And we're looking for that and the Buddy Holly or whatever. And then it's different. And then a little time goes by, and you realize that's ah, freaking better. It's different. It's better. A little bit of comparison there, but um, I have a cut. So, so you're caught up in this grunge wave. Geffen uh, smeared, of course, uh, played a lot here. I had no idea. Like Vancouver at the time in 1992, I had no idea Vancouver didn't have one of their modern rock stations playing the mess out of like. They Alice might have had like there's a rec- there's a couple stations out there. There's one called Sea Fox. They may have been going by then, but uh, you know, CFNY was really early early on us and uh and so underwhelm was big in toronto the, in in this area but i don't think really anywhere else and then we didn't really get a lot more radio play until uh you know four years later or something because because uh, as you say our second record was a big flop yeah okay, this let's is talk for- about that second album because this song is yours as well. See, I'm focusing on the Chris Murphy. Songs. I appreciate it. <laughs> Although in this era, in this era, it was very much about me. It was kind of my band at first to share, and I was willing and happy to share it. And luckily, I did because the other guys, Patrick especially, was kind of became the main money generator, really, like his songs. And uh, but from the beginning, even though even when early on, when all of the songs. A lot of most of the songs were written by me. I was really into this idea that we all share them equally. Yeah, you had and a Beatles esque uh, mentality there, right? Where all four of you would write for each album. Yes, so Beatles in that <laughs> we wanted to be uh, four irreplaceable characters within the band, 
Uh, but the Beatles, they were just the Beatles. Uh, just John and Paul made all the money. Oh, and well, that's uh, right, because they that was their deal with their songs. So they just put their so they just put their songs, and then you know spent less time on George songs. And and Ringo really, Ringo just sang songs that were written by John and Paul. George did have some pretty songs though. Uh, George Here had, comes the sun is a George song. Yep. And, no, George uh, had George yeah. had. I don't think uh, I don't go as crazy for George as as a lot of people do, but. Um, He's, but he's got five unbelievable songs, and then, then is he the Mitch Marner down. of uh, Beatles in that he's playing in the Austin Matthews uh, Nylander Shadow or no? I, I don't know. I don't know what you're you talking don't know about those right names. now. Okay, we'll, we'll skip that comment. I'll yeah. strike that from the record. All right. So coax me though, uh, and twice removed and uh, is not uh, lo- beloved as the follow up to Smeared at the time. I recall. So yeah, it's um, we kind of felt that that uh, the alternative music house of cards was going to come down at some point because it seemed that every every candy ass candle box band was in this sort of alternative club and it's like let's get out of here like at some point someone's going to say emperor's new clothes like what is up with this crappy music so let's get out of here and uh you know our first record i i uh i was hard on it like for the for the subsequent years after i was like it was just like a it was so du jour. It was so. It was kind of like, uh, like it was on the kind of caboose of the sort of shoegaze thing. Like it was almost like a song per song ripoff of the 1988 record. Isn't anything by My Bloody Valentine? Like our our reference points were already kind of over internationally. Were over, but in Canada, it would like seem new. But it was like this is pathetic. Like we're, you know, when you're from Halifax <laughs> yeah. and you know, and and we were just like. We're kind of the shoegaze band in Halifax, um, but when you like when you're going to England, it's like it's embarrassing. It's like this this was this is five years old. Yeah, I hear you. And uh, so we're like, well, let's get out of this. Let's reinvent ourselves. Let's try to make timeless music instead of this sort of like of the times music. So from our second record on, twice removed, you know, our reference points became John Lennon, Plastic Ono Band, Fleetwood Mac. Um, you know these other things like this song right here is a, is basically a carbon copy of uh, "Go Your Own Way" by You Can Go Your Own yeah, Way. Yeah, so it's got that sort of syncopated ah. verses and then the sort of four on the floor um, uh, chorus or whatever. Love that track. Though. So anyway, so we wanted to make is like oh s- smeared. That's so that's whatever hack. Yeah, and then no, and now I like it again because it was like, yeah, it was of the time, but you know, I was, we were whatever, twenty three, twenty two when yeah, we were writing yeah. it, so like that's it's adorable, um, and in a way, um, when you write music that you hope is timeless, the other, you know, then in some ways it, this is maybe a, an unnecessary uh, sidebar, but like when when music is really of a certain time, that becomes there's currency in that. It's like, that really reminds me of that time. But when you have a song that could have come out in 1981 or 1990 or 1965, it's like, when was that? I don't even know when that was. But but twice removed, sorry, just to speak yeah. to your point yeah. from earlier, it was kind of a commercial flop because we, we kind of tried to reinvent ourselves, which Geffen was like, I get it, I get it. You're doing different thing, but really, you're making our job difficult. We've marketed you as this type of band, and now you're this different band. This is the Neil Young thing, where he'd put out like some kind of a. But he was already kind of established. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we yeah. were just like this new band, and then and you know, on the one hand, we were like, and remember, we have different singers. They they thought that was a drag too. It was like, it was like we're trying to market you here. <laughs> yeah, they like and the we're like the front. And then Patrick sings this one, and then, and they were like, you know, Chris, you should sing them all. And re-record twice removed and just make it like smeared, and we were like, "No way, man! This is what we're gonna do." And you know, so a lot of people like that story because it really seemed like we were really sticking it to the man or whatever. Yeah. Whereas, truth be told, I would have probably done anything to be successful at the time. I was like, "This is my opportunity to make something in my life." But um, but that's what we decided to do. And looking back, I'm glad because people do like. Twice Removed did become um, uh, important to music lovers and stuff. It was like it was a real about face, and it was maybe daring to do and and to and to have done it in the face of 
commercial failure and all these things. I, I, sometimes I cynically think that what people like about it is the sort of commercial failure aspect of it more than the music. It's like, I love that you were such a commercial failure. Failure. We love that. <laughs> There's something to that. Uh, it's kind of like an indie rock sort of like loser mentality. It's like, yeah, man. And in yeah. Canada, I noticed that we sort of embrace that. Like we all turned at some point. I know deservedly so maybe but we all turned on Nickelback like because they sell like uh, millions and millions of albums like there's something to that like we we love you because you you didn't sell millions and millions of <laughs> copies of Twice Removed or whatnot but just to, on the, just to close up this yep. coax me uh, sorry Twice Removed point is that I sh- and everybody who knows Sloan knows this but it's a fun fact that the 1996 reader poll by uh, Chart you got to put an exclamation mark. The magazine, uh, music, Canadian music magazine chart, mm-hmm. ranked it as the best Canadian album of all time. Like that's uh, crazy talk, right? That's uh, yeah. That's, so it's uh, hyperbolic silliness, but like, and so you want to accept compliments, of course. Like when you're, uh, you know, vain, as vain as I am, <laughs> but um, but you think, you know, if you. you you, if you take that seriously, then you have to take seriously everybody who thinks you suck. But like, I don't really take either seriously. But um, you can't cherry pick your. Uh... Yeah. So like, if you're gonna accept that, then you have to accept how terrible you are or how te- terrible you will become. You know, when when you're making your eleventh or twelfth album, people and people say these guys used to be cool. It's like, well. We're as cool as we can be for forty-eight-year-old men. Like, what do you want us to do? Like heroin or something? Like, okay. Did you ever do any heroin? Because no. in that grunge scene, we, I know I ask, and I know you already said no, but uh, <laughs> Lane Staley, the anniversary of Lane Staley's death was, I think, yesterday or something like twelve years. Yeah, ago. Uh, that 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 music means nothing to me. I, he's fine. I have nothing against him. So you did not even. Uh, was, Who is that? Screaming okay. trees? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, Alice in Chains. Oh, whatever. Yeah, it's not my bag. Okay. But I love Nirvana, and that was, you know, that's a nihilistic guy, but I, he's also really funny, and uh, Kurt Cobain. Well, yeah, he had his own uh, addictions uh, with heroin. Yeah. Well, we know. So, not, so Sloan avoided that trap fall. That's why you guys are all still with us. Yeah, we were never quite as as troubled, I think, as, as, as Kurt Cobain. I feel like I'm more like a Dave Grohl character. I think that he just, like, loves music, and loved uh, and wants to work hard and is an affable, nice guy. Yeah, he's like a family guy, right? And he's got the yeah. kids and all that. And then he goes and rocks with whatever. You know, a lot of people, anyway. a lot of people make fun of him. Like he's ubiquitous. Like he's like whatever. And uh, you know, if I probably had the opportunities, I would do everything he did too. Like I'll induct Rush into the Hall yeah, of Fame. Yeah. I love them too, but uh, I didn't get that call. You know, I noticed he likes to. He likes to go on drums with like his idols. Like if they need a drummer or whatever, he'll right. jump in there and do that. Well, is, he's pretty good. He's yeah. world class drummer. He's excellent. I heard he was a drummer with a popular band back in the early nineties. So yeah, uh, I saw Dave yeah. Grohl play in nineteen eighty eight with his band Scream in uh, Washington D.C. Wow! I went down to Washington D.C. with some friends from Halifax to see punk rockers, and. And we were about to leave. We had been there already two weeks, just sleeping in a van in the boiling hot 40 degree weather uh, in a place that was way more dangerous than we understood as that's well. That's Fahrenheit. We just like, no, that's Celsius. Sorry. Yeah. You're, yeah. We were just like sleep, not, yeah. sleeping, you know, in a van, like in a parking lot in DC, which is, is like pretty high murder rate and stuff. And then we heard Dave. Uh, we didn't know Dave Grohl at the time, but we heard Scream. It was this band we liked. They're playing in a week. Let's just stay an extra week and see it. And. So we did. It wow. was du- they played probably twenty five minutes and they just played covers and stuff and we were like, we should have probably gone home. We stayed a week for this. No, because now you got that story. But now forever. I have that story. That's, that's right. And I, and what would I've done had I gone home? Just like fart around. That's right. So twice removed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The uh, <laughs> is it true that you guys almost broke up after twice removed? Yes, we. Uh, that became kind of a story because we. We did, we well we didn't break up in the end we came back and then people just thought that we were either pulling a publicity stunt or whatever just making up a story for fun but our we actually did want to break up we were going we were ready to break up and we were essentially inactive for the better part of a year but we were playing shows we were playing the end of the shows that we had 
the obligations that we had. And then there were a couple of um, opportunities to play shows for money that we took because we were broke and young. And uh, But I had every intention of you know, forming a new band or whatever I was going to do. Jay and I were kind of working on a, our little record label that we had down there. Murder Records. Murder Records, terribly, t- terribly named. That Murder R is records. shared, though. That's what you got. Murder Records, they share the R. Is that yeah, like, the second R? Like yeah. Murder Records kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Murder Records. And um, the thing was, I really thought that Andrew was going to leave. I thought that Andrew had already moved to Toronto. The rest of us were living in Halifax. I felt like by doing so, he had sort of established that it wasn't his priority kind of thing. But at the same time, I was so romantic about the 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 chemistry of the members that I was unwilling to entertain the idea of getting a new drummer. So I was like, I'm out. So we fought about that because I think that other people probably were just like, let's continue on and make something with our lives. And I thought, we're young enough. Let's just like reinvent ourselves. We can right. be, make, be in another band or, you know, I had other friends like my friend Matt Murphy, no relation, I was in a band called The Super Friends and I toured around with them as their drummer for a while and I kind of thought that I was either going to join that band or I was going to try to poach Matt and be in a band with him. But wait, there's more. The roots of Sloan go all the way back to 1986 when Chris Murphy met Jay Ferguson and they played together in a band called The Deluxe Boys. Jay Ferguson also visited my home, and we also recorded an episode of Toronto Mike together. Here's Jay telling me about Underwhelmed. This little jam got my attention the first time I heard it. (laughs) She was underwhelmed, if that's a word. I know it's not, because I looked it up. That's one of the skills that I learned in my school. And by the way, I still... I mean, I was overwhelmed and I'm sure of that one Cause I learned it back in day school When I was young Okay, so this song's from Smeared. Uh, I kind of need to step back, actually, but we'll have this in the background. It's a good starter here. Sure. But, uh, like, give me the give me the Sloan origin story. The, the origin of the band kind of thing? Right, you know exactly. I mean? Yeah, right. well, uh, shoot. Okay, so I played music. Uh, everybody in the band kind of played in different bands. Uh, Chris and I were in a band called Carney Lake Road from 87 to 1990. And that was a band also that had, I sang and wrote, and Chris played drums in that band, and he sang and wrote, and then Henry Sangalang, who went on to be in a band called The Flashing Lights. I don't know if you would have been familiar with them. So Matthew Murphy, who I went to school with as well, had a band called The Super Friends, which were on Sloan's Murder Records label. And then he, when The Super Friends broke up, he started a band called The Flashing Lights, and Henry ended up playing in Flashing Lights. So Henry played with Chris, this, uh, sorry, a long family tree here. I'm trying no, to No, I uh, actually, I, this is, this, I need this, okay? <laughs> Seriously, slow it down, in fact. This is good yeah. stuff. Keep so, going. So Henry uh, originally played uh, with Chris and I in Carney Lake Road from 1987 to 1990. And, uh, you know, we play, We even played here at the Rivoli in Toronto in 1990 and got interviewed by Erica M. And uh, I felt like Carney Lake Road was like, you know what, maybe we're really going to make something of this. But right. it's hard. And, you know, the music Music was not. Did, did Chris not, have this song already, or was this something? Oh, for Underwhelmed? Yeah. Not at this point. Okay. No, okay. not. At, I mean, he. When did he write this? It probably would have been. So Carney Lake Road broke up okay. in 1990. Chris and I were still friends, and Chris played music with Andrew, uh, with another friend of theirs named. Uh, shoot, I'm blanking right now. Uh, Jim, and um, uh, and uh, then Patrick also played in a band at the same time called Happy Co. And uh, and then around 1991, early 1991, like uh, Patrick's band broke up. Chris and I started talking about playing music again together in late 1990. And he already knew Andrew, and Chris taught Andrew how to play drums. And immediately, Andrew was a better drummer, like in five seconds. Was, and Chris is a great drummer, but well, Andrew, he, I, Andrew he super, still gets back there. Uh, yeah, every, he does, every time. No, he's <laughs> Chris is a fantastic drummer, but right. Andrew is so musically capable wow. on multiple instruments. Great piano player, super guitar player, and a fantastic drummer, the best drummer in the world. And um, so w- that's uh, it was almost like musical chairs. In, ba- in, in Halifax, bands would stick together for as long as they could, and then it's like, well, we've played the Flamingo 15 times, and we've played every benefit for CKDU, the college station, 
and we can't play anywhere outside of town or we can, but we, you know, it costs us money. What do we do now? That band breaks up and then you start another band. So it's almost like musical chairs. So that's what, so our band started in 1991 with Chris and I and uh, Pat, we invited Patrick or talked to him because his band broke up and Andrew had been playing music with Chris. So it seemed natural that he would come and uh, play drums. And, um, we sort of made some recordings over 1991, and one of them was on a compilation called Here and Now, which originally only came out on cassette. It was like a compilation okay. of Halifax Did this bands. have like, uh, yeah, Eric's Trip and uh, is Thrush Herman on there? What's on there? Uh, Do you remember? They weren't, uh, shoot, were they on that? You know what, I'd have to go back and I feel and like I, ha- I feel, okay, I don't even mean, and, but there's, on this note, yeah. I'm going to ask a question real yeah. quick here from DJ Dream Doctor. Okay, okay. It's a cool handle on Twitter. Wow. My favorite Sloan release is the first EP. Yeah. So he wants to know, A, is that okay? Is that okay to like that? Yeah, that's his it's question. Great. Yeah, no, I love it. I think it's it's a great recording. It's called Peppermint, yeah. His second question is, he wants to know, uh, whatever happened to jail? Are you... What happened to jail? Sure, jail. Uh, so our band, once our band kind of took off, we had Murder Records, which uh, we released to other bands. You mentioned Eric Strip and Thrush Hermit. So in the early 90s, uh, our band... You know, we got successful by, we signed to Geffen Records and we sort of got out of Halifax and a lot of other record labels came to Halifax and signed bands. And uh, we also put out a lot of records by bands from out east. And one of them was uh, Jail, eventually, but Jail had already signed to Sub Pop. So they put out two records on Sub Pop and then an EP on our label. Then they changed their name to The V's and I think they became a trio at that time. But they kind of just, I think a lot of bands... You know, there was an exciting gold rush era in 93, 94, uh, after our band kind of got out. And we were lucky that, you know, we were able to get out and we had uh, a little bit of money put behind us. And we had radio, you know, as you were saying, 102 Point The Edge played our played our records. And um, we were able to continue it almost as a, we were fortunate enough to almost continue it as a business so that we could keep going and make records. And we developed enough of a uh, audience that we could keep going. Maybe some of the other bands that, uh, you know, signed to Sub Pop or other independent labels, they they reached a certain plateau and then it was, maybe they just didn't have that, uh, you well, know, a breaking exp- point it where like they could a- make it over the, the hump to the next, right. the, the next stratus. Because it could, be, uh, it could be very expensive. Yes, exactly. To yeah. be an artist in this country. Certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I think there's a lot, I don't know if it's easier or harder these days. I'm very grateful that we were able to build up an audience, especially during the 1990s. But there were bands, so a band like Jail, for example, they just sort of went as far as they could and they kind of hit a wall and they didn't really have that, oh, that hit song that took them to a broader audience or, uh, you know, were able to play to more people and more people. They kind of just probably hit a plateau and were like, you know what, I'm in my late 20s. Right. Am I going to continue or, you know, maybe I want to get married or maybe I'd want to have a job or pursue other interests or whatever. So that, that kind of happened to a lot of bands from out east. And, you know, our band was fortunate enough that we were able to, you know, have a big enough audience to continue. Underwhelmed was a hit in Canada and peaked at number 25 on Billboard's Modern Rock Tracks chart in the United States. In 1993, Sloan embarked on a 10-week North American tour, which included dates opening for the Lemonheads. Sloan's follow-up to Smeared, twice removed, royally ticked off their record label Geffen, as it was far less grungy, and yada yada yada, they released their 13th studio album in 2022. Did I yada 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 the best part? You're damn right I did. 500 up, take it in, coax me, people of the sky, the good in everyone, everything you've done wrong, the lines you amend, money city maniacs, she says what she means, losing California, if it feels good, do it, the other man, the rest of my life, all used up, who taught you to live like that, believe in me, unkind, scratch the surface, how's that for yada yada yada? Remember earlier when I told you Shania? Alanis and Celine had sold hundreds of millions of albums. 30 plus years of big Sloan singles, high rotation, much music videos, and nine Juno nominations, and they've sold just north of 200,000 albums. But they call their own shots by releasing music on their own Murder Records label, splitting the money four ways with each member writing on their own and even sharing vocals. That same lineup that blew my mind in 1992 with Underwhelmed is intact in 2023. How many bands can make that claim? 
Yes, Sloan is underrated because Sloan is fantastic. And I'm sure of that because I learned it back in grade school when I was young. She was underwhelmed if that's a word. I know it's not because I looked it up. That's one of the skills that I learned in my school. us to the end of our 1310th show you can follow me on twitter i'm at toronto mike but i'm also at toronto mike on blue sky social so if you're there follow me 
Because at any moment now, Elon's going to do something that pisses me off just enough to uninstall that Bluebird app. So I'm on Twitter and I'm on Blue Sky at Toronto Mike. This episode was made possible because of the wonderful support from Great Lakes Brewery, a fiercely independent craft brewery who has been servicing us in Ontario since 1987. Fresh craft beer. Get it at GLB. Get your authentic Italian food from Palma Pasta. Go to palmapasta.com. They're in Mississauga and Oakville. They're also going to feed us on September 7th. Listen closely. This is a free event. TMLX 13 is 6 to 9 p.m. on Thursday, September 7th. We're all collecting at Great Lakes Brewery in Southern Etobicoke. It's down the street from the Costco, not too far from Royal York and Queensway. Join us there, 6 to 9. Great Lakes will buy you your first beer. Palma Pasta will feed you. We're all going to collect and socialize, and it's going to be fun. TMLX 13. Getting Hip to the Hip is coming sooner than that. Getting Hip to the Hip is on September 1st, and I got the exciting news yesterday that Sean Cullen will be there to entertain you. So you get Sean Cullen, you get a Tragically Hip cover band, you get a recording of Getting Hip to the Hip, that wonderful podcast, and I'll be there. It'll be a great time. So if you're listening to this, go to gettinghiptothehip.com and use the promo code FOTM10. It'll save you 10%. And if you want to save money, get your Pumpkins After Dark tickets at pumpkinsafterdark.com. I've got a promo code there as well. It is TOMike15, TOMike15. That saves you 15%. Pumpkins After Dark, the award-winning Halloween event, is in Milton from September 23rd through Halloween. Be there. And while you're doing shit, recycle your electronics at recyclemyelectronics.ca. Don't throw your old tech in the garbage. Go to RecycleMyElectronics.ca and drop that stuff off so it can be safely disposed of. Speaking of safely disposing of, shout out to Ridley Funeral Home. Pillars of this community since 1921. Brad Jones has an excellent podcast called Life's Undertaking. I got a note the other day that they love how Brad talks about life and death and how he records his podcast. I'm honored to co-host it. Find Life's Undertaking with Brad Jones from Ridley Funeral Home, wherever you find your podcasts. Speaking of that, if you like what you hear on Toronto Mike'd, I'd love it if you told hmm, three, no, four, five friends. That's your homework. Tell five friends about Toronto Mike'd. See you all later this week.